Welcome to the Producers Happy Hour with your hosts, Sister Christian and Lawrence Lewis. We are two producers chatting over drinks about what it means and what it takes to be a good producer. So grab your budget, grab a call sheet, grab a drink. You're going to need it. And let's get to it. Because making sh- is hard. Sister Christian, welcome to the new show for 2022. <laughs> Isn't that like I need to, should have popped a Molly. Yeah. <laughs> We're definitely new, definitely improved, and hopefully a little less COVID. But most importantly, drinks. Drinks indeed. And today we're kicking off our Meet the Crew series where we take it back to our original show concept before all this COVID stuff, before all the labor uh, movement stuff. Tell us about it, Christian. <laughs> yeah, which means we're going to be talking to the talented crew members and craftspeople we work with. And finding out their definition of a good producer, because it's subjective, right? Plus, we want to know how a producer and production team could best support them um, so they can do their best work. Yes. And today we are joined with by Amanda Owen, who is a very talented, I know this for a fact because I work with her a lot, very talented and a busy <laughs> wardrobe stylist. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hey. What's everybody drinking today? I have... a. Uh... It's kin. It's like a non-alcoholic oh. anti-anxiety <laughs> beverage. Mm. Yeah. Well, that speaks volumes. Yeah. We need them to sponsor us. Yeah. Wait, yeah, hold on. Who is this? And should they sponsor us? Kin. They should sponsor you. Kin. <laughs> yes. It's uh, life-saving. I've had them before. They're very, they're very good. And I've got a little bit of a non-alcoholic mix in here. I don't think that's the point of what these non-alcoholic drinks are for, but it makes a good mixer as well. This is Moment, non-alcoholic. Also, it's like Kin, uh, but it's mixed with Madre tequila and a little homemade lemon shrub that someone gifted us. Oh, fancy. Feels very Joshua Tree. (laughs) 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 And here's some shrub. I'm having a, and today is National Margarita Day. Yes, that's right. So, mm -hmm, so I'm having a Paloma. Oh, lovely. Well played. Exactly. It's a lemongrass (laughs) Paloma. All right. Well, let's dive in. But first, remember to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts because it helps other people like you find the show. And trust me, we all need to stick together these days. Boy, howdy. (laughs) Exactly. And we definitely want to hear from you. So email us at producershappyhour at gmail.com. Send us your questions, comments, ideas for show topics. Um, You love us, you hate us, whatever. Just send it along. Whatever you want. All right, let's talk to Amanda. Born in Los Angeles and raised in the Santa Cruz Mountains, Amanda Owen has been in the wardrobe game for over 17 years, working mainly in commercial production. Don't uh, (laughs) know. Working her illustrious long career full of (laughs) fantastic stories and tons of (laughs) experience. Working mainly in commercial production as well as feature films, short films, print, and music videos, Amanda specializes in custom builds and character work and also specializes as a mom and a ceramicist. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Amanda. Thanks, guys. I don't know about specializes as mom, but I get it done. (laughs) (laughs) More more so than either of us, that's for sure. Exactly. (laughs) So tell us, why don't you just start off by letting us know, like, well, obviously you've been doing this for 17 years, but have you worked in other positions that kind of led you to being a wardrobe stylist? No. Or this was just it from day one? I was going to design school, fashion design. Um, I wanted to be a clothing designer and I uh, started a clothing line and it was pretty successful right off the bat. Um, The first store I got into was Fred Siegel. Uh, Wow. Nice. Yeah. So that was cool. But um, I didn't really know like how to ramp it up from there. And in the meantime, I had met a guy who was a wardrobe stylist and he kind of sold me on it and said, you know, come help me out one day and see if you like it. So I went in and assisted him. Liked it a lot, thought it was challenging and fun and fast paced. And then a friend of mine who worked at HSI back in the day was uh, handling the Grammys and they needed someone to style the opening stage performance for the gorillas because they obviously don't have actual people. Um, So it was gorillas and Madonna opening the Grammys. And that was my first (laughs) styling job. Oh my God. Um, And I had no idea (laughs) what I was doing. 
Um, but I called a couple of friends who did it and they kind of walked me through how to do it. And, and, uh, I just fell in love. I kind of thought every job was going to be like, that. <laughs> and, uh, it's all Madonna and gorillas. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Like sitting down in the, underneath this Staples center or wherever it was. And, you know, Stevie wonder is walking by and Mariah Carey's walking by. I was like, this is the best job ever. <laughs> you know, And then reality <laughs> <laughs> kicked in right <laughs> then you're on a verizon commercial with like three thousand yeah, exactly. extras right yeah i went What's to a that? home depot commercial from that and i was like oh, <laughs> this oh is everything's orange <laughs> exactly. yeah <laughs> exactly what's your involvement with producers how do you work and engage with them or do you normally get hired by the director and then you have to work with a producer you don't know or what's the normal process uh, it's about 50 50 for me brought in by producers or EPs versus, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, direct request from director or agency sometimes. Oh, I love that because, you know, sometimes you know the producer and sometimes you don't. So I'm sure you get a variety of producers. It's a real mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Experience levels. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. There's, you know, people have very different working skills or working methods and it really runs the gamut. And skills. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and skills. <laughs> and skills. So, and, and that's skills. yeah. And that's why part of this is figuring out what defines a good producer because we can think that we're good all day long, but unless you do, that we may not be good. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of why we, you know, we only know the way we work. So how do you engage I only know the way you and I work together. How do you engage with other producers? Is it kind of the kind of the same? Are you do you In some situations, are you only talking to the director or do you have limited access to some directors? How does it, how does it work for you sometimes? It's really a case or I guess job by job deal. And a lot is dependent on how I'm brought in. You know, if it's the director requests, it's usually me communicating directly with the director, you know, CCing the producer, you know, to always keep you guys in the loop. But if it's a new director and, and either a new producer or Um, producer that I work with a lot, you know, it's more dealing directly with them and limited access at some times, you know, to the director. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some jobs where they won't even let me contact the director at all, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And you just go, everything goes through the producer. Everything goes through the producer. Yeah. Interesting. Which usually hasn't worked out very well. I mean, I'm just sitting here with my mouth open, y'all, thinking to myself, yeah. wow. Like, well, how, how, does, do you, how does that like, work? It's, it, right. Well, when you don't hear, when you're not in the conversation with, like, say, with the agency and the director, right? So the director has to convey it to you. But if they have to convey it to their producer and then the producer's doing the conveying, it becomes a game of telephone where five people have handled the information before it gets to you. And then yeah. how are you supposed to do your job if you do not have proper information? Yeah. I mean, and I've even had it where uh, the director just doesn't want to deal with it at all. And so it's the producer. Yeah. You know, the producers, it's like a best case scenario, like Mm -hmm. guess, really. Like, well, I think this is what he usually, he or she usually wants. So let's go with that. And then, you know, that has really not worked out well. Well, do you find that sometimes, well, in those situations, it feels like you're giving them something to say you're guessing. So you're giving them something to say no to, so you can at least figure out what their taste is or anything. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, it's like you get into a fitting and, you know, one person may have an expectation that things were communicated or that we would just inherently know that this is what they wanted. And when it's not actually there and it's something like we have to go reshop or repull. Mind um, reading? Yeah. Yeah, it's you're expected to rinse the wine. Yeah, exactly. So I love that That's quite my frequently, actually. <laughs> yeah, but I, for me, I I love communication. Like that's how I am best equipped to do. All of us, I think, are best equipped to do our job. You know, the more communication, the more information that we're getting, the better we can manage whatever desires are being presented, and also the unexpected stuff too, like those last minute requests. Like when we're covered on everything else it's a lot easier to to handle those last minute changes or requests well nothing ever changes come on <laughs> what do you mean never. last minute never. what are what are some of the My things life is last minute yeah what what, yeah. Are some, what are some of the things about your job that 
you would, like if you were to take a producer and sit them down and say, here are the things that I, that happen in my job that you don't even know about or that you wish people knew, maybe not even production, maybe not even producers, but also production teams and directors that kind of like, kind of go without saying it's stuff that, you know, is there anything like that? Some uh, secret sauce or some secret things that you guys deal with that we don't even really know about? With any department, you know, I think you never really know what the intricacies of it are until you actually do that job. For us, it's it's time. It's time and manpower. And the limitations, you know, that are kind of set into place by our vendors or by stores or by seasons, Budget. by where we live. Like, you know, is this a... I just did a job recently that had duck hunters. And <laughs> there's... Not a lot of duck hunting. It's not in duck season. Los Angeles. So just so everyone knows. <laughs> Hot tip. Yeah, December <laughs> in LA is not duck hunting season. So, like, you know, in that, it's like having the information with enough time to get those things, to find those things, to ship those things. Well, I have something to jump off of that. I had a friend, a uh, wardrobe stylist, good friend in New York who used to always, no matter what, have a pregnancy belly on her. Just because, you know, you just never knew because there's like two or three directors that were all like, let's put somebody pregnant, you know? <laughs> and so is there anything that you keep around in your kit or anything like that? That's something that you just randomly will always have or use? <laughs> that's hilarious. I love that. I used to have this big... spell jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. Oh, anyway. I used to have this big giant Madras bag in my kit and it was just full of all kinds of random stuff, like random eyeglasses and cutlets for boobs and props and waitress aprons. And, you know, just, it was full of just the crate, like whatever I got on every job, I just threw in there and I would bring it on every job. And I can't tell you how many times that bag saved my life. I got rid of it or actually, no, I still have it, but I don't, I don't bring it anymore. (laughs) Because I think like, especially for the directors that I work with a lot, I kind of know what they are going to want. And so I kind of know to have that standing by just in case, like the weird little odds and ends. But yeah, no, no pregnancy belly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or I love that. <laughs> and it was just the, what are the, yeah, because, you know, when you're doing a job with a gazillion extras or whatever, you just, you, um, as much as we as producers try to explain to, you know, talent as well as you do, like during call time process of what to bring, it doesn't always happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, Frequently. Um, so yeah. you have to be prepared. <laughs> Especially with non I'm trying to be nice here, too. but it's every yeah. time. Every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean they only showed up with stilettos and bathing suits? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think too, uh, like over the years, I've learned how to like word things in the emails that are sent out for um, like wardrobe specs that is more easily understandable, I think. But there's always like one or two live wires that you're like, what, what is going on? <laughs> what are you on? doing? What job are you on? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you... Yeah, are, dating. Are, are, there, are there specific things that, that happen in a job that, that um, are your pet peeves that, that kind of prevent you from having a happy job experience? Whether it's from a director, producer, or production team or other crew members? I I think the biggest thing for me and my department is like when there isn't communication, you know, when things aren't being passed down Mm -hmm. and we're not getting the information, whether or not it's like what's happening with talent or, you know, what the conditions, like what special needs might be on the job. Um, Like when that stuff doesn't get to us, you know, and then it's kind of like this last minute rush, like to cover things or, you know, we're left kind of holding the bag and we don't have the stuff that we need. Like, you know, that's, that's the hardest thing. Like that is kind of what makes it feel like we're always like chasing our tail is when we're not getting, you know, the information in a timely manner. You know, and the other thing too, is having enough labor. Yeah. I think a lot of times there's just kind of this assumption that it's going to be, you know, a key plus one for my department. And, you know, in a lot of jobs, that's perfectly adequate and and great but um you know the more people you start to throw at it the more special needs you start to throw at it if there's any stunts is there resets like multiples stuff like that you know you get into situations where you might need more 
And I'm not sure if it's like how the job is bid. I feel like there's an equation, you know, that just kind of gets like typed in. Oh yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, mm-hmm. it doesn't always happen that the, the the actual like specs of the job are taken into consideration when that, you know, is, is happening. That's 100% accurate, first of all. Yeah. And second of all, <laughs> do you ever have a producer or production manager? Because sometimes, you know, it depends on who's, uh, how large the job is or whatever, conveying information to you. When you get the all the information, do you ever have a producer come to you and say, now that you have the information, let's talk about your team and how many people mm-hmm. you need and what you think that your budget should be? Yeah, is I that, do. How often does that occur? Oh, good. I think that that for me is like 101. Yeah. (laughs) I think that happens more with people that I work with more often, you know, like anything Mm -hmm. you, you build trust and in this relationship, you know, and it's learning that like, I'm not going to ask for stuff that I don't need kind of thing. And having the Mm -hmm. trust that like what I do ask for is actually really needed. I, I think that that's a conversation that happens a lot more with people that have worked with me and know that like, I'm I'm not going to just go overboard on on stuff like this. You know, if I ask for it, I really need it and I feel like that opens up, you know, the comfort from your guys's end to say like, okay, what's the reality of of mm-hmm. what we're asking you to do and what do you need and you know stuff like that. And there are um several companies that will call me beforehand and have me bid the job and that's always nice too. Yeah. Until really they, nice. until, they don't, until they don't, until they don't put your number anymore. Until, yeah. until, they, until don't. they don't actually use the numbers that I've yeah. given them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, I've had that that discussion too of like um, when you know, as a, a line producer being hired to do the job, we have no idea what the bidding process is. So yeah. you'll take a look at it and go, oh, and there, <laughs> and you'll hear, well, we <laughs> uh-huh. did pass it by the stylist. You're like, well, all right. And then you go, well, that's what they, and, you're, and then the story from the stylist is, fuck no. That is not what happened. <laughs> I've certainly been on the receiving end of that. And we're like, great. So let me see. Let me talk to our department and see if they've got some extra, you know, whatever you have to do to like get more money to you. To happens, around. But yeah. Yeah. And our department yes. never has extra money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why ask wardrobe if they have more money for it? Yeah, I know. Then it's like, Ever. well, they, craft yeah, service never has money. Ne- never like, has. We're it. coming for craft service. Yeah, yeah. We're taking all the craft service money. <laughs> no, no snacks. What, yeah. Exactly. What has what has changed? I know, obviously, lots changed over the last two years. But specifically, like in your workflow process, I know you're talking about shipping things and getting things on time. Um, oh my god, it's such a disaster! Everything, everything had changed with the checking out stuff at, at costume houses. What are the big, big mm-hmm. things that are still a problem to this day from the pandemic? Everything's more expensive. Mm. Even a like rental, crazy. even studio rentals are more expensive. So much yeah. more. So much more. Every, it was like every rental house took the pandemic as an opportunity to raise their prices, which is so crazy to me. To raise their prices and sh- uh, they were trying to shorten the amount of time that we could take items out, you know, on um, approval and stuff. And I mean, when it first, when we first came back, you know, there was actually this moment and I, I feel like I've heard this from a lot of other departments as well, where there was this kind of hope, you know, because the costume houses would only let like two people in at a time right. for a three hour block. And that's all you got. And if you couldn't call for a same day drive on, you had to give 24 hour notice. And so it really like paced things out in a different way than we had ever experienced. And, you know, other departments were having that as well. And there was this kind of like <laughs> very naive hope that, you know, that would kind of change the structure of our industry a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. that some of that would be lasting. And it, it seems like it's gone the opposite way. You know, everything's more expensive. Sh- shipping stuff is a disaster. Like you just don't know when you're going to get it. Disaster. And yeah, like I just got an email from Amazon this morning that was a return that I sent back like nine months ago. <sighs> Finally got credited back to my credit card. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. It's insane. And like they. Yes, but that's something that you put into your budget saying, okay, well, I'm going to get that return in like, you know, three weeks or something, but you've now waited for that long. It's just hanging out there. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm carrying that balance on my credit card. Ugh. Yeah. You know, which is like, oh, that's costing me money that wasn't part of, you know, any reimbursement or whatever. 
it's the the new cost of doing a job because right yeah. now FedEx is like it gets there when it gets there. Yeah, best of luck. Weather. You're like yeah, where? Best of luck. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> there was weather yeah. in Indiana, so you didn't get your stuff in <laughs> L.A. You're like every I I agree with you where the go um the pandemic has caused supply chain, but also like companies just to say, yeah, I know that we, before this, you could get anything same day, but now we're not doing no. that. We're not going to yeah. even guarantee it. There's no way that you're, you know, good luck. Yeah. And a lot of companies are just not willing. Like, I think they took the, the opportunity to be able to like, learn how to say no, you know, mm-hmm. like a lot of my independent mm-hmm. vendors are just like, no, I'm not going to work all night on this. Yeah. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to work over the weekend. You know, that, that sense of urgency that, you know, we've always kind of existed with in our industry was supported by a sense of industry and vendors. And, and it's not that anymore. Like there's very firm lines drawn in the sand, which makes it hard. You're like, I need this patch tomorrow morning. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's an emergency. (laughs) It's an 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 emergency. It's an advertising emergency. Yeah. But that's true because before we could do it, and now we can't. So there's a lot of disappointment going around because people have set boundaries. Yeah, which is hard because I don't think that that's mirrored on the asking side on you Mm-mm. know the Mm-mm. the agency client end at all. Yeah, you know, for a minute it was like, well, we were able to say no, and that was really fun <laughs> for a second. <laughs> yes, it was a good time. Um, that was a good time. You know, and now that everything, you know, the world is basically considering itself open again. Why, what do you mean you can't do this? Right. You know, we want to do this crazy thing, but we're also going to give you guys less money to do it. And less time. And less time. Yeah. And not enough help. And not enough help. Yeah. It's the struggle with like budget is insane now. Do you think there's ever a way of us ever returning back to the, to how things were? Like if Honestly, it, if enough jobs fail or enough problems are caused, is there any hope of? I think it would have to fail on such a massive scale. You know, that's kind of yeah. always like the yeah, that's true. the moment. Like my friends, you know, and I are all also in wardrobe. We talk about it. Like there's going to come a point where we're not going to be able to deliver because you know one way or another, we all of us pull the rabbit out of the hat, you know, and get something, some version of what's being asked for done and we talk about that moment when it's when we're not going to be able to do it and i don't think that that kind of failure is going to be universal enough for it to really communicate a need for change Mm -hmm. you know up the line Mm -hmm. and there's also all these other companies you know the non-union companies you know that there's always somebody else who's willing to give it a shot you know and cut it up a different way to deliver or at least provide the appearance of delivering so no, I, I don't have a lot of hope in it, sadly. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> that's okay. We've I mean, been yes. we've been doom and gloom for two years on this podcast. So <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I'm not I'm not a sore thumb here. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. It's it's um because it's it is about expectations and what people feel that um they can ask for and wanting to get back to that point where they could have whatever they wanted. But, and we're the messengers saying you can't have everything you wanted like you could. And it's really hard for them to accept. Yeah. So it only yeah. comes from that trust relationship that you're talking about. Well, I also think you have two kind of, you know, struggles that are coexisting in the same space at the same time. You know, it's like, this need to ramp back up to that like pace of work and and ability to provide. But at the same time, like the pandemic allowed us a moment to step back and like gain some clarity on what is, what does quality of life mean for all of us? Right. And what is accurate and appropriate compensation for your time mean for all of us? You know, Mm -hmm. if you're not going to have the quality, what does that compensation look like? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think you have these two opposing existential crises of sorts like happening in the same space which is interesting i feel like as you're describing this existential crisis your wind chimes are getting louder and louder and more beautiful <laughs> behind you <laughs> that's my zen moment yeah, yeah. that and my kin yeah <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, then why don't why don't we end on this? If you um, for those producers out there who you haven't worked with or who are younger or um, maybe less experienced than some of, you know, the people that you normally work with. Do you have any lesson? Like, do you have any advice or lessons for them that they, you know, should know about your department so that they can support you better? And, you know, cause we're all a team, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, my, my big thing, you know, again, is just communication. You're going to build that trust that, you know, we talked about, but in order to do that, you have to take those first steps. And by opening that communication and listening to the people who know what their department is and, and what it takes to get this stuff done, being open to receiving that information, um, allowing those keys to feel heard and, and supported just in, in that dialogue, I think is, is really crucial. Like you got to build that relationships. You have to start somewhere. So the more that you communicate, the faster you'll, you'll build that, that trust. and make everybody's life easier excellent i love that because yeah yeah, if i mean i don't i'm not a wardrobe stylist but what i've done is hired somebody who is a seasoned professional so why wouldn't i trust their information exactly yeah you know it's the same on our end like we you know have to trust that you guys you know you're kind of like the center of a wagon wheels like in my mind you know it's like you guys have all of these things this you have the big picture and we might be thinking one thing, but, you know, you guys know that all these other things are happening. Um, and so we have to trust that you guys too, like that, you know what you're doing and that you have, you know, the crew's best interest at heart and the project's best interest at heart. Yes. I mean, the crew before the project, but. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Crew before Obvious. the project. Crew before yes, the project. That's yes. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. not every, that's not every producer, but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> nope. it's definitely what we strive for. Amanda, thank you so much for spending some time with us and enjoying your non-alcoholic yeah, beverage Thanks with us in the happy hour and having a drink with us today. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, I didn't have to pick up a kid. I'd have a margarita. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is National Margarita Day, so. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for having a drink with us today. Um, what's the best thank way you. for people to get a hold of you if they'd like? Uh, I have a website. Uh, it's amanda-owen.com and it has all my contact info and my reel. Christian, how do people get a hold of you? SisterChristianProduces.com and Lawrence, if people want you, how can they get you? LawrenceTLewis.com. Those are all of our URLs, guys. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs> mm, <Okay. famous. laughs> Thank you. Right. See you next time. Producers Happy Hour was brought to you with the help of Christopher Daniels, who is a design and branding specialist, and Eric Beals, who is our podcast editing wizard. Thanks for listening, and remember, enjoy Happy Hour when you can, because making shit is hard. Ah, eh, what are you going to do?